Hello, everybody. I'm Dan Flett. I'm a broadcast engineer with Global Television. I work mainly in outside broadcasts, doing uh, the V8 supercars, the AFL football and the NRL. Um, today I'll be talking about Ethernet-based live television production. Looking at the future of live multi-camera production where engineers like me will be plugging in less cable but building more powerful and, more, and cheaper facilities than today. Ethernet has become the standard network in the IT industry and as evident at this conference, it's uh, taking over many parts of the broadcast industry as well. Live multi-camera production seems to be the last bastion of the old baseband ways. I didn't think Ethernet was all that well suited to reliable, truly live video production, but recent technology enhancements are looking to change that. In light of this, I thought I'd share my thoughts on how this affects the TV industry. So where's the industry at the moment? We use multi-camera production, uses the circuit switch method. Why? Because it's worth, because it works. Each signal has a cable all to itself, it's reliable and it delivers very low latencies. We're talking about latencies of one to 100 microseconds from camera to the output of the vision mixer. If you add processing to those camera feeds, you're then looking more like uh, 20 to 80 milliseconds, a frame or two of video vision. And this, for us, in live broadcasting is problematic. It causes uh, lip sync issues. And basically, we don't like latencies on the order of milliseconds. Um, traditional Ethernet uh, is unsuitable for this because it drops packets when their switches become congested. Um, what happens is, uh, well, TCP can retransmit the packets, but for truly live video, uh, if a T TCP has to retransmit a packet, the moment is lost. Uh, traditional Ethernet can be fast or reliable, but not both, not without a lot of manual tweaking. Uh, broadcast quality uh, video, over P is, video over IP is done, as, uh, as we saw with the, um, the uh, FIFA World Cup and uh, Delhi, which uh, David Wheeler will talk about. Um, it's in fairly common use, and even on uh, Fox Sports, NRL, AFL, we see a broadcast quality video over IP. Uh, but, and IPTV as well is also out there, and you could, because it's a broadcast medium, you could call it broadcast quality. Um, it's not quite suitable for multi-camera production though, because the latencies are too high for inside a production facility, or the latency is just not predictable or stable enough for us. Now, here's a, a photo of uh, my truck during a Bathurst V8 supercar event. That's a pretty typical scene at an outside broadcast, pretty similar to the other photos you've seen. Um, uh, and uh, as the other speakers have talked about, OBs can be absolutely huge these days. You know, Olympics, Grand Slam tennis tournaments, uh, uh, FIFA World Cup. Now, the bigger the OBs, the more cable, the cable just multiplies almost exponentially. You need to do more testing, you need more time, you need to have bigger crews. It's a manual process and it's very expensive. Um, Packet switching allows us to multiplex a lot of this. It will simplify our cable installations. Uh, it will automate our signal routing. And you won't need this uh, little uh, piece of paper up here. That's our spreadsheet that we use to uh, keep track of what cable does what. With uh, an IT-based system, uh, you really don't need that much, so much. So, looking at the way our bandwidth has increased over time, with uh, digital video, you started out in the uh, early 90s with uh, SD, SDI, 270 megabit. These are SMPTE standards, obviously. Uh, late 90s, we had HD, SDI with uh, 1.5 gig. And uh, a couple of years ago, we uh, had 3G, SDI for uh, 1080p signals. And that's obviously 3 gigabit per second. But the, um, the bandwidth capacity of Ethernet has increased uh, by a factor of 10 every five years. Since it was first released, you had your 10 megabit, there's your 100 megabit, 1 gig. 10 gig, and just last year, 100 gigabit Ethernet was released. Now that's very interesting to us. It's uh, got the ability to um, multiplex possibly uh, 67 interlaced HD 1080i signals or 33 1080p progressive scan HD signals. Very interesting indeed. So, doing live video over Ethernet. Why use uncompressed video? I've been uh, mentioned it a couple of times now. Um, lots of broadcast systems use uncompressed video. Why couldn't oh, use compressed video? Why couldn't it be used in live switching? Um, well, the big problem with that is latency. Uh, the fastest 
uh, broadcast quality compression introduces at least one frame or 80, 100 milliseconds of delay. This causes lip sync problems within the production facility. But also, every device has multiple inputs, multiple outputs. Each of these inputs and outputs would need to have its own codec chip. Um, and the codecs would all need to be set up the same way in every device. It's a layer of complexity and it's also expensive and not really interested, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we would rather stay with uncompressed video inside the production facility as it is today. Uh, now, can Ethernet do synchronisation? Now, our vision mixers have uh, approximately 4 to 20 microsecond auto timing windows. So that means that the start of frame of video for every source to that vision mixer need to arrive within 4 to 20 microseconds of each other. This ensures glitch-free switching. Um, and synchronisation, uh, to hit inside that window, needs to be predictable and stable. Um, we don't want to have to, a separate frame synchroniser for every input of a vision mixer. It would uh, add uh, a lot of cost and it would also add too much delay. Vision mixers can uh, pass vision a lot faster than that without having to process it. Enter audio-video bridging. So, um, audio-video bridging was uh, formed by the uh, IEEE AVB task group uh, to address the deficiencies of uh, current Ethernet's ability to handle AV streams. Uh, most of the standards have been ratified, and including all of the ones on the screen here, they've been ratified. Uh, and um, equipment is starting to appear on the market, and you see here there's a co-branded uh, Netgear BSS Audio uh, gigabit switch that supports AVB. That's out on the market now. And that's designed for the audio market, obviously. Um, but for the television market, we would look at something more like a 10 gig or 100 gig switch with AVB capability. Um, AVB gives you plug and play traffic management. Uh, now, if the, the switch and the endpoints, that is the signal sources and the signal destinations, support AVB, uh, you get all of the benefits you see here, and that includes uh, bounded latency, which is basically it's a, tr a form of traffic shaping, automatic traffic shaping that uh, gives you a maximum latency guarantee. Now, for 10 gig Ethernet, that should be about 2.5 microseconds per hop. But the faster the switch, the lower the latency. Uh, AVB also has a standard for genlock over the network, and that's based on the uh, IEEE 1588 precision time protocol, and that's what uh, Paul Briscoe from Harris has been talking about this on Tuesday. Um, and that is a, a nanosecond accurate version of the network time protocol. Uh, so nanosecond accuracy is pretty good for synchronisation. And uh, the one the last one I want to talk about here is uh, these reserve bandwidth paths, this uh, stream reservation protocol. And what that does is it, it allows the switches to reserve from endpoint to endpoint, so from signal source to si signal destination, reserve the bandwidth for audio or, or video or data streams. Uh, it means that these streams cannot be affected, they won't drop packets, it's like having a virtual, virtual circuit from source to destination. Um, and this standard also uh, makes sure that the, the bandwidth from across the network can't be saturated. If a switch comes close to being having its uh, bandwidth saturated, it doesn't allow any more streams onto the network, so it protects the streams that are already on the network. Um, other helpful technologies in that will uh, allow television to use Ethernet uh, is the, uh, the high bitrate media transport, which was developed by the Video Service Forum. Um, SDI, in its current form, was designed for a cable to itself, so a coaxial or a fibre cable. Um, it can't tolerate packet loss, and so you'll get glitches if you lose packets, so it's not suitable for a packet switch uh, network. Um, the uh, HB RMT uh, adds uh, forward error correction to the data, which is you know, redundant data, so it allows it to tolerate some packet loss. And it uh, would be useful to us for uh, networks beyond control of the, the broadcaster, i.e. telco network. So it's, it's very good as a contribution. I believe it has been and is being used as a, a, a contribution method. Um, but in the, uh, the studio and outside broadcasts, um, I believe uh, IPv6 will also be very uh, useful to us. Um, I believe it should be, become standard in, in new devices. Uh, the main advantage of it is that it has a much larger address space than IPv4, which is the current internet standard. Um, so much space, like there's 
a ridiculous amount of address space in IPv6, and it means that the network administrators or people running the network never need to worry about to make, uh, running static addresses. You never need to centrally all allocate addresses, and you don't need to conserve address space. Um, IP addresses in IPv6 can be based on the Ethernet MAC address, uh, which is a stable address, and just have a dynamic network prefix for you know, the truck or, the, or for the facility. So under IPv6, um, television engineers should get used to not ever having to worry about dyna no, dynamic IP addresses. Just let the, uh, the system take care of it. You don't ever have to worry about you know, your 192.168.x.y. You don't want to know about it. Just let the system worry about that. So the, the effect of running uh, Ethernet in live television, what effect will this have on our um, systems? Now, for cameras, you can continue to use the SMPTE 311 um, hybrid fibre copper cables, but instead of carrying proprietary signals, they just carry 10 gig Ethernet. And uh, the copper pairs would power the camera. And all of the signal I.O. is via Ethernet. So your, your tallies, your comms, your, your vision input and, and return vision, your return vision, your vision output, and uh, all of that stuff is all multiplexed over a single Ethernet connector. This makes the CCU redundant because the CCU does the job of multiplexing all your signals. Um, Ethernet itself becomes the multiplexing medium, so you don't need CCUs. Um, you know, all your signals uh, to and from come, go to and from the camera head directly. You don't need an intermediate device. Uh, it'll also affect signal routers and distribution amplifiers because they're redundant. Um, Ethernet is the distribution medium. Uh, you can use multicasting to split signals in the switch. So you don't need your old uh, big video or audio matrix. Uh, you don't need your DAs because you, your network switch does that job. Um, vision mixers won't change much in appearance or in, in, in operation, uh, possibly. Uh, but the forest of BNC connectors on the rear panel are replaced by a couple of 100 gig Ethernet connectors, or maybe more. But you'd always have one extra 100 gig Ethernet connector for redundancy. Moving on to video replay devices such as uh, EVSs, uh, you know, compressing and recording video for, for replay. Um, they would just need a, a couple of 100 gig Ethernet connectors on the back, like the vision mixers. Um, and all of your control, so you, you can plug your control into the, uh, uh, your remote controller into the network, uh, all the inputs and outputs, audio and video, including your compressed video streams, you can extract out of the box, or you can feed compressed clips into the box via via the gigabit connection. And it gives you the possibility of having a bit of flexibility in your architecture. If you wanted to, you could separate out the codec module for, and have a central storage area, gigantic RAID array, and have all of the boxes record their vision onto that if you wanted to. Uh, that's up to probably the engineers of those devices how to do that, but that's a suggestion. Um, that would affect uh, multiviews. Once again, you get the massive advantage of cutting down on all the BNC connectors and just a couple of uh, 100 gig ethernets. Um, but you could also, over the network, because uh, you're on the network with all of your, your tally and your signal names and all of your data, uh, your multiview can auto-detect that information. If they come up with a common standard for uh, things like tal um, tallies and signal names, you wouldn't even have to tell the multiview where to find that information. The, the system, sh it should they should just be able to find that information themselves. Uh, multiviewers could also detect each other. So if you route the output of one into the input of another, it would, it would know that that's going on and you could uh, edit the, uh, the, two, uh, the two screens at the same time. There are systems that already do this, but you, uh, with Ethernet, uh, the multiviewers are able to actually know if one output's going into another automatically without you having to tell it. Um, uh, we also come to um, signal processes such as you know, arcs, colour correctors, uh, up and down converters. Uh, these days you often multi, um, yeah, you merge these functions into a multi-card. And I've seen some devices at the uh, exhibition where multiple multi-cards are merged into a single box. Um, Harris has got a box that does that. Um, the, the advantage with uh, running these on Ethernet is that obviously, again, you get rid of all the BNC connectors. You have a couple of uh, 100 gig Ethernet ports and all of the capabilities of that box uh, are online just by virtue of plugging in one or two connectors. You don't have to plug up a bunch of BNCs to make it all work. 